you wanted the best, you've got the best podcast. The hottest, hottest. podcast in the world. In the world. The Chris Voss Show, the preeminent podcast with guests so smart you may experience serious brain bleed. The CEOs, authors, thought leaders, visionaries, and motivators. Get ready, get ready. Strap yourself in. Keep your hands, arms, and legs inside the vehicle at all times because you're about to go on a monster education roller coaster with your brain. Now, here's your host, Chris Voss. Hi, folks. It's Voss here from thechrisvossshow.com. There you go. When the Iron Lady sings it, that means it's official. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the big show. For 15 years, we've been bringing you all the wonderful people, all the smartest minds, the brilliant authors, people who spent a lifetime learning their trade, their craft, telling their stories, building it out, learning, researching, all this stuff, and they bring it to you in this beautiful concise there's almost like should be a vase for it uh maybe the chris voss show is the beautiful vase i don't know i'm pretty ugly so it's it's one ugly vase probably I'd get it Voss vase i just made that up right now anyway guys welcome to the chris voss show the family that loves you but doesn't judge you as harshly as your mother-in-law uh we're going to be talking with an amazing author today and he is telling the story of uh unknown history you know over the years we've had lots of great authors on who've been telling the story of uh, the true story of our history and some of the things that were kind of hidden or what some people call whitewashing of our American history and telling the stories that have been the untold stories or hidden stories of our history that are some of the most important to tell because they're some of the most important things that have changed the future of our country, impacted our country, et cetera, et cetera. In the meantime, before we get into that, we do demand, it's not a demand, people. Go to goodreads.com for it says Chris Voss, LinkedIn.com for it says Chris Voss, YouTube.com for it says Chris Voss, uh, and Goodreads, uh, or I'm sorry, we did that one. It's Monday morning, folks. Uh, Chris Voss won the ticket. He talking to you, Chris Voss, Facebook.com. Uh, we have the author of the newest book that's uh, just come out, November 7th, 20. 23 called invisible generals rediscovering family legacy and a quest to honor america's first black generals doug melville joins us on the show today he's gonna be talking about his amazing book and he has some relations of these folks to uh tell us the deepest story that you can probably get from anyone close to it uh doug melville is the uh is one of the most innovative voices in corporate diversity and currently splits his time between the united states and switzerland and he is the head of global diversity equity inclusion in the luxury industry his first book came out which tells his family story of america's first two black generals a father and son uh, that was just released, and uh, he is the global head of diversity, equity, inclusion for International Luxury Holding Company, and he sits on the Governance and Sustainability Committee. He is responsible for drafting the DI, DEI vision, measuring and embedding metrics, and strategizing around DEI as a business solution. Welcome to the show. How are you, Doug? Chris, how you doing today? How you doing? I'm actually live from Switzerland right now. How about that? Live from Switzerland right now. Am can I, I your sp- first guest from Switzerland or no? Uh, I'm not sure, but can I wire you some money to put in a number to account for me? Oh, they don't do Listen, that. no one will ever know. The IRS <laughs> is on people like sticky fingers out here. Don't try to be cute. With oh, this don't, don't. Account. don't. Don't try to skirt your taxes, folks. Uh, don't do that. It's bad. Um, uh, the uh, And if you earn enough of money, I mean, it's just kind of a privilege to pay your taxes, really, when you think about it. Uh, so, Doug, give us a .com. Where can people find you on the interwebs? Yeah, so you could log on to uh, DougMelville.com. Um, as you said, this is my, my first book that I've authored. Instagram at Doug Melville. LinkedIn at Doug Melville. Uh, and then also you can just, you know, search for Invisible Generals. Uh, the title of the book, anywhere your books are sold, audio books, physical books, ebooks. So uh, that's kind of the, the skinny on the dot coms. There you go, skinny.coms. Uh, you can find us at skinny.coms on OnlyFans. Uh, <laughs> invisible, OnlyFans call that jokes. They're the best. Uh, invisible Generals, uh, give us a 30,000 overview of what's inside. So Invisible Generals is uh, the untold story of America's first two black generals. They were a father and a son. 
And at the start of World War II, before they reached general status, of the 335,000 people in the military, they were the only two black officers. Wow. Who worked together as a team to help integrate the United States military, which is 75 years ago this year, Mm -hmm. and ultimately create and command the world-famous Tuskegee Airmen. Mm -hmm. This is while they were in service. And the son went on to work for the Department of Transportation and help lead the creation of the United States Air Marshal Program, commercial airport security, and the 55-mile-an-hour federal speed limit. So these men did so much for this country but were treated as if they were invisible because of their race. Wow. That was the onus for me to tell this story because when my dad shared it with me, upon turning 80 years old and me inquiring, I felt that someone in the family and someone who uh, had heard firsthand because my dad was there his whole life understand the story at a very personal level needed to share that these military stories are about the military and the missions, but they're also about family, fathers and sons, and what people will do to sacrifice for their country. There you go. And as I mentioned in the in the prior show, we've had a lot of great people on, like Eddie God Jr. And, and other people have talked about the whitewashing of history. And we've seen arguments of that recently in Florida. But the, these stories are important because they, you know, it, I, I never realized at the time, but growing up looking at history, there's a lot of white people in my history class. And uh, I'm white, so I can say that, I suppose. Uh, and, and over time, we've learned through movies and books like yours that that there's a lot of untold stories likely over prejudice because um, they just they just got left out uh, over prejudice. Uh, I think I think there's a reason these stories then then didn't, didn't, didn't happen. And I imagine now you can look at the U.S. military and be you know where would it be without black people or, or the NBA for that matter or sports. Um, so what what was the uh, motivation uh, about behind why you wrote this book? I understand there was a movie involved. Mm-hmm. Yeah, well, first of all, I want to say that um, the tapestry of America is made from all Americans. And I think we somewhat do ourselves an injustice when we divide everything in boxes, Mm -hmm. you know, Asian history, Native American history, black history. I mean, that's kind of how America is set up. But I think if we looked at all of it as the umbrella of American history, we would Uh do ourselves a larger um, justice by Mm -hmm. looking at it as one totality of history, because everything is like your body. Yes, your leg hurts, but your arm could be affected. It's all connected, and it's all affecting each other. Mm -hmm. So I think that that's just the first point about why these stories are so important that we tell. Mm -hmm. Um, The reference to the movie, and thank you for bringing that up, that was the onus and the spark that lit the flame for me. So we were in the year 2011. Mm -hmm. Uh, I'm currently working, you know, not as an author or anything of that nature. I'm living my best life. And I get invited to a, a screening of a movie called Red Tails. And mm-hmm. uh, for your listeners or viewers that have seen it, you know, it's about the black fighter pilots of World War II. Now, mm-hmm. uh, the patriarch of my family, Benjamin O. Davis Jr., was the centerpiece character of the movie. And he was played by an actor named Terrence Howard. Mm -hmm. When Terrence Howard got on the screen, we all knew he was playing the commander. He looks exactly like Ben Davis Jr. Mm -hmm. And when he's addressed by a fellow soldier, he's addressed as Colonel Bullard. Mm -hmm. So I'm looking around the theater trying to figure out what's going on. And then afterwards, there's a party And I keep asking people, what happened to the names? And they were saying, Doug, you know, this is Hollywood. This is an amalgamation of characters. You know, Doug, this isn't a documentary. Doug, you can't have half the characters real and half fake. Doug, you don't understand how Hollywood works. And I'm sitting here going, wait, did there just a whole screening for a movie for the families? And then the names aren't included in the movie? Now, some were brought on as advisors, and there was all little ways people were it, it brought in for their opinion. But to mm-hmm. me, the names on the screen yeah. were the whole thing. 
You know, I don't want to hear about all that other stuff. So I went home and I tell my dad and I'm furious. And my dad says to me, Doug, Doug, if you think changing the names are bad, let me tell you the family story of the Invisible Generals and how at seven years old, I went down to Tuskegee and I was raised there by Ben Jr. And I saw firsthand all the ways we were treated as if we were invisible and how these men fought for their lives and how they were the only two black officers and the military was so conscious of them and they got so much attention that we had to live in hiding. We couldn't do interviews. We couldn't wow. go out and play. So my dad's telling me this story and it's not really like a military story as he's telling it. It's just a family story of, you know, hey, this is what we went through. But I left that meeting sparked to go on my own and research these two men and say, if they're left out of the movie, if my dad describes them like this, what really happened? And that sent me on a 10 year quest to discover my own family history and uncover the accomplishments of these two men. And that's awesome. And now you've told it in a book. Yeah, it, you gotta love it, man. Uh, I, uh, the Tuskegee Airmen uh, film by George Lucas. I'm surprised there wasn't a Death Star in it. They had to blow up. Um. <laughs> it was one of his. It was actually became his last movie before he sold. Oh, was it the organization huh. to the Disney Company? Yeah. Um, and I and I and people sometimes that uh, you know sometimes when I talk to people like do you hate it? What do you hate Red Tails? And I say no, no. I appreciate Red Tails for exactly what it did. Mm -hmm. It scaled the story around the world. It brought this unbelievable story to life, and that was a chapter. But my chapter is my family's contribution to that story as an additional next layer. So I look at everything as. You know, history sometimes is looked at as back in the day, but we're all building off it. So I just looked at it as part of the next narrative of what we needed to do. There you go. And it put you on a journey to learn your history. Tell us a little bit about you. How did you grow up? Did you had you delved in the family history in the military? Had you had you been exposed to any of it? Was was that prevalent in your in your being raised? No, not at all. Um, I was uh, 10 years younger than my brother and sister. So my parents, you know, if you ever have a baby 10 years younger than your brother and sister, your parents are like, listen, you know, you're going to have to fend for yourself and find food. And here's you have to fend for yourself. Wow. Yeah. But they were cool about it. And they, and that was our whole vibe. Um, Sounds my, like very Gen X's. Yeah. <laughs> That's what my parents were. Latchkey kids. So, um, but every occasion, every Thanksgiving, every holiday, we would always go to Arlington, Virginia to visit mm. Ben. Mm -hmm. And he was the center of our family. And as a kid, I didn't know really what was going on with this man. I just knew he always wore red. And he was the most loving, positive guy in the whole world. And all he ever wanted to talk about is what do you want to do? What do you want to be? What, you know, how can I help you get smarter? Education is everything. Character is everything. But it was a little over the top. You know, it wasn't like a normal you know, older guy in the family where you're like, oh, you know, this or that. He just kept going on with the same things. His house was all feng shui with Buddhas and waterfalls oh, yeah. and uh, not anything about the military. But when we, we would go to Thanksgiving every year at, at Andrews Air Force Base and everybody would always salute. And I would always say, Dad, what, what's going on with Ben? And he'd be like, oh, Doug, Ben. You know, he fought for America. He was a general, so people salute him. Never said really anything about it. Hmm. So in 1998, we all get invited to the White House. And President Clinton, at the time, after a 10-plus-year campaign by Senator John McCain to get Ben Jr., his fourth star, uh, in 1998, they the number came up and we were told that he we were all invited to the white house and on the wow. day they light the christmas tree ben jr was going to get his fourth star that he should have gotten in active duty in the mm -hmm. 60s in 1998 and this is when i you know was like wait what like what is going on you know because i'm there in the front row <laughs> i'm like what is this what did this man do this, this is this is crazy yeah and the night before we go to get the fourth star, there's a whole um, argument in the family because the government 
was willing to acknowledge that he deserved his fourth star. But we had to sign a piece of paper that the family wouldn't get compensated for it. So we would get the honor, but we would not be compensated for, for the back pay or something. For the back pay and everything. And this is over 30 years. So Jeez. Ben's wife of, of 60 plus years doesn't go to the ceremony. Wow. So I knew something was going on, but this is the first time, and I'm in my 20s, you know, this is the first time I'm really going, wait, what is really going on with the story? And that was really the first thing that sparked my interest. We get the fourth star. And then four years later, Ben Jr. passes away on the 4th mm -hmm. of July, 2002. Mm -hmm. Was he cool? With, did he go and get a star? That we see there? He went and got his star. His wife and, going to uh, go. And he, and because he said, you know, I've, I've told my father that I was going to be a full four star general. And on this day, I promised to, uh, you know, complete that honor. So he, he was going to go get the star. Mm -hmm. And that was something that was important to him and actually important to, the future because if you're not a four-star general there's certain buildings that can't be named after you and there's certain mm -hmm. honors you can't receive so mm -hmm. ultimately it was very important in our family story that he got the four star mm -hmm. but this is really the first time i knew what the man really did because it just wasn't talked about in our house wow that's extraordinary uh and so you you find out you know you you go to the uh you go to the film you find out that uh you know history's been kind of whitewashed again uh what's some of the research and and uh what tell us about some of the challenges uh that the generals went through i mean why, why were they picked as the first black generals uh what was their role or what was their you know implied role and then what did they actually do i think we talked about this pre-show uh and and what were their, you know, did they have the same sort of limitations as other generals? Mm -hmm. So um, what I actually found was that my family story really began in the late 1800s with a guy named Lewis Davis. Mm -hmm. And Lewis Davis was born a servant, but was raised, uh, essentially hired out by a certain individual named General Logan, who you may know from Logan Airport in Boston or Logan mm -hmm. Circle or Square in Chicago in D.C., General Logan brought this young boy in and raised him and almost as a, a little bit of a son, even though he was it, that really wasn't how it was intended to be, but ultimately became a guiding light for this young man. And uh, Logan's best friend was President Ulysses S. Grant. Mm -hmm. So during Grant's second inauguration in the buggy on Pennsylvania Avenue was Grant and then Lewis Davis with Grant's son on his knee because he was the babysitter for Ulysses S. Grant. So wow. the reason I bring this story up is because if it's not for this part of the story, mm -hmm. they never get the signatures needed at the time to get Ben Davis Sr. into the military and get him elevated to officer. Oh, wow. So that was the very important turning point. In 1901, after being rejected from West Point because they didn't want to get in the habit of allowing blacks to enter, uh -huh. President McKinley signs uh, officer uh, a promotion to Ben Davis Sr., mm -hmm. and he becomes in 1901 a black officer. Okay? Mm -hmm. This is so important. He, he becomes an officer. He joins the Buffalo Soldiers. He learns to be an equestrian. He's mentored by a gentleman named Charles Young, who was the only other black officer in the United States and a West Point grad. And Charles Young says, listen, we can get people through West Point that are black, but you almost have to train them from the time they're born. You know, almost like when you look at like LeBron James and his son, it's almost like you have to get these individuals ready from day one. Hmm. Ben Sr. listens to Charles Young. He starts a family, has a wife, three kids. His wife dies, dies during childbirth, oh. and he brings his only son for a $5, which was a one-week pay, barnstorming plane ride, and his son comes down and goes, Daddy, I want to be a pilot. <laughs> He's hooked. And this is where I would have said, son, it's time for ice cream. You know what I mean? <laughs> I mean, I can't say I would have done because the valor starts right now, but he said, yeah. you know, I want to help you live your dream. Aviation was less than 20 years old. It was segregated. He goes, even 
the government can't turn down a West Point grad. That's true. So he trains his son for 10 years to get into West Point. His son gets into West Point. They get the one signature from the one black congressperson, Oscar DePriest. Wow. And then when they show up, they don't know he's black. So is I'm it the- because he's he's uh, uh, because the color uh, is because of the color of his skin? It, wow. He 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 entered as a black cadet, obviously. Yeah. And uh, they didn't know, so they give him a makeshift room, and. On the second day, he runs down to a meeting in the sinks, which is where everyone gathered, and the door was locked. And they said, "We've accidentally let a, you know, a black cadet in. Oh, we are to treat him as if he's invisible until he drops out." Wow! And Holy this crap. went to school, Chris, four years. Four years. Fifty weeks a year, no human interaction at West Point. Wow. That is crazy, man. And, and so they just try to force him now, out they by go, ignoring him. It can't happen. If yeah. you go to West Point now and ask anybody, they go, you cannot graduate here without a study buddy. Wow. That is crazy, dude. And so he he so what does he do? He toughs it out or he says you're I don't know. Yeah, yeah. Man. No, he 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 toughs it out and he gets to four years of school, never could eat at a table because it's segregated, and every time he had to ask for permission, he wasn't granted. Holy shit. He went to the Army-Navy game at Yankee Stadium in a segregated bus. Wow. He failed classes like ballroom dancing and CPR and boxing because no one would partner with him. Mm-hmm. And after all this time goes by, Chris, he's still in the top third of his class. And wow. a few months before he graduates, they say – what do you want to do? And he said, I want to fly airplanes. And they said, you can't. The policy doesn't allow it. And he goes, but I did it. I graduated in the top third. That was the assignment. And they said, why don't we pay you to go and start a law firm and honorably discharge you? And he said, no, I want to be a pilot. He graduates in the summer of 36, 1936. And when he shakes his dad's hand in the graduation photo, they are in that photo, the only two black officers in the United States. So his dad became an officer in 1901. The next officer that was black was his son in 1936. Wow. So this is what made me say, I have to go into the story. And it was a turning point because in 2015 after setting a google alert after watching the movie because that was the first thing i did mm-hmm. 2012 13 14 come by 15 hits the google alert goes off west point is looking to name their biggest 100 million dollar barracks building in the middle of campus after one of their greatest grads and there was three names on the docket william westmoreland norman Schwarzkopf, and ben davis so I reply to the Google alert, go online, get the email addresses, go up to West Point, and I tell them the story just like I tell you and say, you have to consider him as the name. And all of them couldn't even believe it. Wow. And they then gave me their historian to look into the research and opened up their archives. And then they started getting more interested in the story. And then we all realized no one actually knew the real story. Wow. Wow. You know, it was there, but it was gerrymandered is what I call the gerrymandering of history. It's mm-hmm. it's there, mm-hmm. but you got one file over here, one photo over here, one thing in this museum, one knowledge in the presidential library, some from friends, some from family. Wow. And it takes family really, to me, has to put this together. It's just hard to do it as a historian because the, the connection is just not there. It's hot and cold at times. People don't want to talk. People don't want to say what happened. You know, there's trauma. There's, you know, all the things. So for me, that was the steps that I went through and got us to where we are today. There you go. So these guys finally, I get, except in the military, and they're they're generals. But how does that role play out? What sort of other prejudices they run into and, and limitations? Well, the thing is, is that they started as officers and then they could, the military wouldn't allow blacks to be in charge of whites. So in a hundred percent segregated military, the father, Ben senior 
only worked with segregation his whole career. And in 75 years ago this year, he worked with President Truman to write the integration plan for the United States of America. So his big accomplishment was becoming a general and also working with Truman to write the integration plan. The trick there was six days before Truman introduces Executive Order 9981, he asks Ben Davis Sr. to retire so his name was not included on any of the documents. Mm -hmm. So that was a big blow for Ben Sr. And that's when Ben Jr., his son, was there, and he said, Dad, I will redeem us, and I will make sure that going forward I go to heights literally and figuratively that you couldn't go in your career. And that's when he became a one, two, and three-star general. He was commander of the Tuskegee Airmen. But in 1967, when he was supposed to get his four-star from President LBJ, LBJ had made a decision that he had done enough for black Americans from Thurgood Marshall being promoted to the Supreme Court to executing against Martin Luther King's plan for integration and, and civil rights that he wasn't going to get any political benefit. So he denies Ben Jr. his fourth star. Jesus. And Ben Jr. can't get a job in private aviation. There's very few black pilots. He couldn't work for wow. the post office or FedEx or anything. So the government creates a job for him to help with public commercial aviation. And the first thing he says is, we need to make commercial aviation as efficient as military aviation. And he goes on to create commercial airport security. There was only mm -hmm. two airports in the U.S. that had a scanner and x-ray. Mm -hmm. So he said this needs to be a global and domestic system. Mm -hmm. He created the United States Air Marshal Program and trained 4,000 men to go undercover on commercial flights. Wow. And those two things were so successful that the Carter administration brought him back to help do that for traditional transportation. And then he led the creation of the 55 mile an hour speed limit. So mm -hmm. I tell this story because it seems impossible that we would never have heard of this man or his <laughs> dad. I, I know who to blame now for all the speeding tickets I got when I was young with my BMW. And they hated him, by the way, Chris. They hated him. <laughs> the 55 mile an hour. They hated uh, him. He, yeah. he got bad press. <laughs> There you go. Uh, thanks to Jack from LinkedIn, Jack Raymondson. A great story, sir. True resolve. What a family story. You know, this is the, the interesting story. These these young men have this goal to become part of the U.S. military, to fly, to mm -hmm. to become successful. And but the amount of the amount of walls that are built in front of them, the amount of prejudice they have to overcome, the amount of oppression they have to overcome, limitations. Uh, and and some people would give up, just go, okay, well, you know, obviously you don't want me here, you know, West Point, et cetera, et cetera. Mm -hmm. But the resolve that they took to uh, stick it out, to fight through, to to mm -hmm. realize that they could change the world. You know, there's one of my favorite quotes, quotes by my hero, Bobby uh, Kennedy, is uh, each of us can send forth, a, uh, can change the world, can impact the world, basically, and send forth a uh, tide that, that changes everything. It's the, uh, I forget the name of the thing, but it's the ripple of hope speech mm -hmm. in South Africa that he gives. And each of us can send forth ripples of hope that can change no, the, the, exactly the mightiest right. of things. Um, so this is a great story you get into. You tell the story of your family, you tell the story that's been hidden all these years. Uh, and what, what do you hope uh, people come away from when they read the story? Yeah, I think, you know, if you if you read the book, you'll see there's so many layers to it. But I mm -hmm. think a, a great way to kind of close it for the viewers and the readers and, and the listeners is really around one key thing. Number one, you must tell your family story. Mm. You must write it down. You must talk to the people on the couch that may or not be slothing. <laughs> you must get people to communicate. OK, this is very important. Number one. Mm -hmm. Um, number two is you must be present to our veteran community. Yes. There's so many veterans out here that did things after work, uh, after working in the public sector, and that have changed the world. And we just don't know these stories and who they are. 
And I think once you do those two steps, for me personally, the third step is use the system to diffuse the system. If you uncover evidence, uh, facts, uh, information where you feel you have to continue the generational elevation that your family started because a lot of times now chris we don't look at our family as starting the journey you think you're born and you'd be like i am this and it's the it's like what your family did many things for generations past to get you here today so i think just knowing that is a big part of it but then once you know that what are you going to do about it because that's what my dad told me and that's when i switched my career to become a diversity officer but mm-hmm. also I switched my mindset to say you can't fix something and complain about something at the same time. That's true. That's use true. The You've got to be accountable. Use the system. And then once you start getting involved in systems, then you get a voice, then you get a vote, then you can change policy. Mm-hmm. But the last thing for the reader or the listener is time. The impossible takes time, but in time you can accomplish the impossible. These things are not going to change overnight. But if you put a commitment to it, like you commit to watching every episode of Game of Thrones or knowing every joke from Seinfeld or reciting every line from Friends, you know, people know a lot of different things. Every video game, every plane serial number, seating configurations and Greyhound buses, you know, people just know random and interesting (laughs) things. But what I want to tell people is take that time to learn your family and take that time to take inventory of what people did to get you where you are. And hopefully you can uncover your own invisible generals and help inspire you or your children to a better future. There you go. What a great vision, inspirational message. There's a few shirts and coffee cups uh, uh, lines you just They're all yours. They're all yours. Yeah. So uh, as we go out, I I mean, imagine, you know, it's hard to imagine a segregated military nowadays. In fact, we've got Mm -hmm. military generals in the White House and everything. I remember how hard the Trump administration tried to fight. I forget the general. It it wasn't uh, General Milley. It was, who's the general now? He's, He's the head of the military you know, cq so. brown is the joint yeah. chief staff yeah and you have um the secretary of defense uh as uh, they're both um military men both people of color so um cq brown actually was air force pilot so he's been mm-hmm. so amazing to our family and worked so hard and uh 2019 the united states air force academy renamed their airfield davis airfield wow uh and and general brown was so important to that and then west point ended up naming that barracks in 2017 so to me the irony of these two men is that the largest installation at the air force academy and west point are both named after the same person Mm -hmm. yet many people still don't know who this man is wow and it's good. it's glad that you're here to tell the, tell the story of him and put it down in the history book. So now that's a great thing about a book. It's it's like it's out there forever. Uh, so I mean, it, it, it's hard to imagine you know these these people pioneering you know going through this this hell of of trying to just you know li- live a normal life as a human being uh, that everyone else is doing and going through all the oppression and stuff. Um, I mean, I imagine just what they have done to change the legacies in the future of our American military, the contributions yeah. of, of veterans and military soldiers. I mean, you know, it's just extraordinary. Yeah. You know, I think um, one thing about the segregated military is that the Tuskegee Airmen was 15,000 men and women, mm-hmm. about 1,000 pilots and 14,000 ground crew and support staff. But to me, what was crazy about when I was going through the research and learning more is that you had a man in his late 20s who had never commanded anybody is now in charge of 15,000 people during a war. And because the military was 100 percent segregated, the airplane parts from white planes couldn't be used on black planes. The The wrenches used to fix white planes could not be used on black planes. So when they gave the black pilots all the worst planes, but then couldn't get the parts, they decided to give them the best planes with the new parts and the new planes. And that was the P-51. Mm. The issue was the maps were segregated. So when Ben Jr. was getting maps of where the allied forces were located in the 
European theater, many maps did not have his military uh, base on it. And he told the men, so we don't get bombed by our own guys. Mm -hmm. I would like you before our longest mission on 4th of July weekend, 1944, to paint the tails red so they know we're Americans. And that was the birth of the red tails. So the story just, it's just so mm -hmm. unbelievable that, and this is why when we go back to the movie where you started, yeah, the red where I movie. say, why was I upset that the name was changed? This story to me is the story. Yeah. There is no Tuskegee Airmen without this story because someone had to get it started and command it. Yeah. Unless we really take a minute to understand that part, the other part is 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 equally as important, but this part cannot be omitted. Yeah. And these are the stories that altered the history of this country. Mm -hmm. Inevitably, uh, you know, the greatest contributions as well. Um, you know, uh, the people that put their lives in line for this country, um, uh, we need, need more recognition mm -hmm. and need more appreciation, especially in today's world. Uh, you know, we, we've had lots of authors on the show that talk about, you know, the high suicide rates of veterans and the, the fallout of veterans, the homelessness mm -hmm. and stuff. It's just, it's something we really need to fix. P these people put their lives on the line. Um, and, uh, and, and fought like hell. So there you go. Uh, give us a final pitch out to readers to pick up the book and order it wherever fine books are sold and, and wherever they want to find out more about you and what you're doing. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, if you want to find out more about me, I'm at Doug Melville or, uh, Instagram, Doug Melville or, or, or LinkedIn, the same. And my, my final pitch to readers is the second half of the book is how to become a visible general, a step-by-step -step guide on how you can uncover your own family story, your own veteran story. And even if you never served and you were in a veteran family like I was, there's a rich history in your couch, in your living room that is not talking before it's too late, before time passes through us. Please take that moment to understand their story, because if this story was invisible, who knows what other stories are out there? And it's our responsibility to know that these individuals work in the public sector and their stories are public domain. So if a reporter calls you or a photographer calls you and they write it down or photograph it, they own it. So at a minimum, you need to own your own story, take control of your own legacy, build your own narrative, and then start being the person that realizes you are a continuation of what your family started and it doesn't begin with you. There you go. So inspiring, Doug. People in the in the comment section are so inspired. Uh, so glad I tuned in. Serendipity. Thank you both. Uh, people just loved your story, Doug. Uh, give us your dot coms. Where can people find you on the internet? Interwebs? Yep. Uh, DougMelville.com and uh, Instagram at Doug Melville will be good. There you go. Uh, thank you very much, Doug, for coming on. What an inspiring story this morning for people, and and uh, people should pick up your book. Thank you so much, Chris. I appreciate your time today. I appreciate your time as well, sir. Uh, order up the book wherever fine books are sold. Invisible Generals, Rediscovering the Family Legacy and Quest to Honor America's First Black Generals. Uh, you know, familiarize familiarize your guys your <laughs> familiarize yourself guys with the stories of history the one thing man can learn from his history as i always say is that man never learns from his history and thereby he goes round and round we need to the, the importance of history is uh, mastering it is important to understanding our future and changing it so there you go uh thanks to our audience for tuning in go to goodreads.com for chess chris foss linkedin.com for chess chris foss youtube.com for chess chris foss subscribe to the big linkedin newsletter the 130,000 link LinkedIn group over there. Also go to Chris Foss one on the tickety talkity and uh, Chris Foss, Facebook.com. Thanks for tuning in. Be good to each other. Stay safe. And we'll see you guys next time.